<sighs> Good afternoon. Let's see. Things to talk about today. Um, let's see. Things coming up. Uh, with respect to labs, uh, there's nothing formal that's uh, going to happen with respect to labs uh, this week. Uh, if you would like to meet with your TA to discuss anything at all pertaining to the course, um, please make uh, arrangements with them. So that could be an individual uh, meeting or a group meeting. Um, so just contact them. Um, certainly, if you ever want to meet with me, you just uh, contact me and uh, we'll see what we can uh, do. Uh, with respect to the chemistry reports, the second report, the, ke the chemistry report, uh, your individual marks are posted up in Canvas now, uh, so you have access to those. With respect to the biological analogy report, um, uh, we have a revised rubric, and that I will email around to everyone uh, very shortly. So uh, Elizabeth and Emily have uh, worked on that, made some revisions. I expect they're pretty minor revisions to the, the prior rubric, but nevertheless, there are some revisions to the rubric that will be used uh, for marking the, um, the biological limnology report. Uh, then lastly, with respect to the end of term essay, uh, there was a question of whether you could cite your own reports um, for in, in those essays. And sure, you're welcome to uh, cite your own reports. There's a question, is that the best source though? And um, you know, you, you'll have to judge that. Uh, in some cases, there may be published literature pertaining to the lakes or um, you know, things that were produced by the Ministry of Environment that might produce better information, although maybe it happens to be out of date. Uh, in some cases, there may be unique information uh, that was present within the uh, data that we collected this fall that uh, is useful for the um, to cite in your final reports, and you're certainly welcome to cite those. There was also a question about what um, uh, you know what the reference formatting would be, and the reference formatting will be just the same as for the other reports. Uh, so follow the Canadian Journal of Fisheries and Aquatics uh, Sciences style. Uh, someone said that approximated uh, Chicago style. Um, anyway, you, it's the same format uh, as uh, what um, we've been using for uh, the physical limnology, the chemical limnology, and the biological limnology reports. So I think that's all that I have to say with respect to uh, those upcoming sorts of things. Um, you know, you can make good use of the um, fact that we aren't running formal labs at this point to, to meet as groups and to uh, um, work on those, those uh, biological knowledge reports and also on the end of term essay. So today I'm going to be uh, talking about um, lake ontogeny and, and actually the, the next few lectures are all pertaining to how lakes change through time. And of course, that aligns fairly closely uh, with what the end of term essay is about. So we'll be talking about how lakes change through time in the uh, upcoming lectures. And today I'm going to be talking about lake ontogeny, which is how they would naturally, refers to how they would naturally uh, change through time. And my background today um, pertains to this in a, a strange way. We were doing some studies on a lake uh, over in Switzerland, and we needed to get a core from the bottomless lake to study how the lake had changed uh, over the course of its development. I think this was in relation to climate change studies. And uh, this particular lake is called Zeebergsee, which simply translates as Lake Mountain Lake. So it's the lake on top of Lake Mountain. Uh, and what you can see the fellow is blowing into is actually an Alphorn. Uh, so I step here to one side and you can see there's an Alphorn the fellow's um, blowing into. And this particular lake is set in kind of a, a cirque. So it's got an amphitheater uh, lake uh, surrounding. And I gather it uh, creates uh, sort of a magnificent echo uh, coming off the mountains there. And so while we were working on the lake, this fellow came along and was blowing into his Alphorn and, and playing it for our benefit. <laughs> this wasn't arranged, it was just 
one of those random things that happens when you're you're working up in the Swiss Alps. Okay, so that's a um, little bit of background. Now we'll jump into lecture. And as we jump into lecture, I'm first going to talk about um, procedures that we use for coring, uh, for doing paleological studies to, to look at how lakes have changed in the past. So next thing to do is to share a screen. Okay. And get things set up to go here. Okay, so today's lecture pertains to paleolimnology and lake ontogeny. And as I said, first of all, I'm going to start talking about um, field procedures that we would use to collect material for paleomological studies. And so pretty much any sort of paleolimnological paleo study uh, starts with um, getting a core from the bottom of a lake. And we use a variety of different uh, techniques to, to get these cores. Uh, the, perhaps the simplest of all the coring devices is something that you're already a bit familiar with, uh, a gravity core, because I, I presented a gravity core uh, to you in the virtual field trip. Uh, so you saw uh, there, you should have seen uh, uh, me deploy a gravity core out in the field. In that case, it was a HTH core. Uh, and then uh, there's a final video at the end. The last video uh, shows how we extrude the sediments from that core uh, to uh, uh, conduct the studies. In any case, a, a gravity core simply consists of a, a core tube. Usually this would be a, a plexiglass or Lexan tube, uh, you know, uh, a clear tube uh, that's connected to a headpiece. And um, a, this headpiece, in this case, includes a plunger. Okay, so the core tube fits into the headpiece. And there's a plunger up above uh, that uh, will be released when the trigger mechanism up at the top of the headpiece is triggered. And how we trigger that is by dropping a messenger, a cylinder, a weighted cylinder, brass or, or lead or whatever, uh, maybe stainless steel down along the cord. So we, we lower the core down into the mud on the end of a long cord we lower it down until it penetrates into the mud. And then we drop this messenger down along the cord. The messenger runs down along the cord, hits the trigger at the top. That releases the plunger to seal the top of the tube. And then we can pull that uh, core tube back up to the surface. And um, anyway, that's, that's pretty much all there is to it. One of the things that's important is uh, that the moment this plunger um, breaks the surface, at the top, uh, the seal isn't particularly good. And so the moment it uh, breaks the surface, there's a tendency for your sediments to go rushing out the bottom of the core tube. So it's important to, to remove the core tube or put a, a bung in the bottom of the core tube um, before that headpiece breaks through the surface. Otherwise you're likely to lose all your sediments uh, down back into the lake. Um, so that's an awkward thing. Um, this uh, approximates something that was developed by uh, Kayak and Brinkhurst years ago. So it's often referred to as a Kayak Brinkhurst core. Well, this particular one is, is modified to some extent. And so people often refer to it as the glue core named after John Glue, who um, was quite famous for his innovations in that regard. So here's a, an example of one of these uh, KB or kayak brinkers cores or glue cores being operated in the field. And this is up around Sudbury. Uh, so uh, here we have three people. This is John Small, who's a professor uh, and Canada Research Chair at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario. Um, one of his colleagues, Brian uh, Cumming, who's also at Queen's University. And uh, John Kingston here, unfortunately, is deceased, died of a brain tumor uh, some years ago now. But anyway, they're lowering one of these kayak brinkers cores. Actually, they have lowered one of these kayak brinkers cores down into the bottom of this lake, and they've now retrieved it. And you can see here uh, the sediments contained within the, the core tube. So they brought it up. 
So once you bring it up to the surface, uh, you need to prepare some notes. So here, John Small is, is measuring the amount of sediment that was captured in the core tube using simply a tape measure. Oops. Um, then once made some notes, uh, you know, some observations on the nature of the sediments and how much uh, mud was actually recovered. I uh, would drain off the, uh, the excess water off the top until you only have sediment within the tube. And then you slowly force the sediments up through the tube uh, and scrape them off. You know, maybe maybe a centimeter at a time, maybe half a centimeter, maybe a, a, a couple of millimeters at a time. In any case, here you can see the core tube. The core tube is sitting up on uh, top of a, a piston that's being forced up through the tube uh, in one centimeter increments, or it looks like one centimeter increments to me at least. Uh, so forced up one centimeter at a time, and then the mud is scraped across and packaged up in one of these world pack bags. Each bag is uh, labeled with respect to what the lake is, the date, and what depth in the uh, core uh, it was taken from. Okay, um, so that's one kind of core, and it will penetrate, you know, one of these kayak brinkers cores will penetrate maybe 30, 40, 50 centimeters down into the mud, usually not beyond that, um, because it's just sinking in under its own weight. So they're good for collecting the surface sediments of mud, you know, back about 50 centimeters, which usually is enough to, uh, to sample, you know, maybe the last 100 or 200 years of sediment, um, roughly, you know, the earliest sediments that you'd capture in that core may have been deposited just prior to European settlement, depending upon where you are in North America uh, or, um, um, you know, or where, what part of the continent you're from and just sediment deposition rates and so on. Uh, this is a similar sort of core, but this one's really only intended to, uh, to collect like the upper five centimeters or so of mud. So sometimes we just want to get an idea of what presently inhabits the lake uh, by getting uh, the very, very surface. And so this is something referred to as a Hongvi core. Um, so it's something else that can be used over here is a, uh, what we refer to as a mini glue core. It's very much like a, the KB, but just to scale down. And it's just for sampling the, the very uppermost sediments from a lake. And it's light enough that it's easily deployed off, a, you know, really easily deployed off a canoe or even off the uh, float on a helicopter if you land on a lake. Okay, now uh, the problem with those gravity cores is they don't, they don't give you a long sample. You know, you can get maybe the last 100 or 200 years in them, but uh, you won't get older sediments. So if we want to get sediments that are older and if we're trying to reconstruct uh, how lakes have changed over a longer period of time, we somehow need to get longer cores from the bottom of um, longer cores from the bottom of the lake. And um, one of the devices that's been developed is a Livingston core. Now this is an example of a piston core, meaning that there is a piston inside the core tube. And so I'll illustrate, uh, I provide an illustration of what a Livingston core is like over here on the right. So the, the Livingston piston core uh, consists of a core tube. So you can see there's a core tube. Usually this would be a stainless steel tube. And there's a piston that blocks the entrance to that tube. And the piston is attached to a wire or a cable, a cable that runs up through the core tube and up through the headpiece and then up towards the surface. The core tube also is a, equipped with a headpiece. Um, so the headpiece fits into the core tube and also has a hole for that cable to run through. And it is also attached to a whole series of core rods. Okay. Um, so we're going to use these core rods for lowering and pushing the uh, core into the sediments. Now this is before we start a drive. The core tube is one meter in length approximately. So 
We lower it down in this position with the piston blocking the entrance. And when we're down to the depth where we want to start taking our sample, you grab onto the cable up here at the surface, you grab onto that cable so it secures the piston in place and push the core tube beyond the piston. So you push the core tube down past the piston. So the piston remains in place where the core tube is pushed past it into the sediments and that cuts out the sediments down below. Then once uh, you pushed as far as you can down into the sediments, it's necessary that you grab on to both the cable and the core rods and pull this thing back up towards the uh, surface. Now, um, the reason we have a piston in here is first of all, it's going to block the entrance of the sediments into the core tube until we're down to the depth where we actually want to start to sample. And also it creates a seal it creates a seal inside the core tube um, so that when we push down, there's kind of a partial vacuum that is generated just below the piston. And that um, assists, that partial vacuum uh, helps um, assist with the recovery of the sediments down below. The partial vacuum generated by the piston resistance reduces the resistance to the core tube penetration. Anyway, the Livingston core using this, you get with each drive, you get one meter of sediments. You get one meter of sediments. Commonly, we want to get much more than that. Instead of wanting one more meter, maybe you want six meters or seven meters or eight meters, or perhaps somewhat more sediment than that um, from the bottom. And so we can do this by repeatedly going down exactly the same hole and pushing one meter further down in. Um, so here's the, the fellow who developed this thing. Uh, so this is Dan Livingston. He's responsible for um, developing the Livingston piston core. Um, uh, he passed away sometime in about the, the last five years or so. Um, anyway, uh, he uh, he was born in Detroit, but uh, you know considered himself to be Canadian, and uh, spent a lot of his time in his youth living uh, and uh, having summer vacations up around Cape Breton uh, in Nova Scotia. Anyway, he became um, a professor of zoology at Duke University in. That's in the Carolinas. I forget. I always forget whether it's North Carolina or South Carolina, uh, where he was the professor. Anyway, so he's the person responsible for developing this device. Um, here are some shots of field work where we're using with um, this. Uh, so um, here we're. This is this is some field work on the north slope of the Yukon, um, and so. This would probably be in April, I think we were doing the sampling. And so we flew in and landed on the surface of the lake. So on a plane, the, the ice at this point is about two meters thick. So there's no concerns about going through. Plenty of ice to support an aircraft and to support us and our coring operation. So there's, there's the, the, the plane. And um, over here, uh, we're starting the coring procedure. And our first step there is to take out an ice auger and cut a hole through the ice. And you not only need an ice auger, you need an extension in order to get through ice that thick. Uh, and then here's the setup. Uh, we're on the, the surface of the ice. And in this case, to assist us with forcing uh, the rods uh, down through the sediments when the sediment gets stiffer, we have a mechanical device here, uh, a chain drive, uh, nicknamed Boro for, for forcing the rods down. Uh, that would um, reduce our manual effort. Okay, now, now in that case, we were using Boro to try to force the, the rods into some very stiff sediment, but usually we wouldn't have a a chain drive like that along. Usually we just do this uh, by hand. And 
Uh, so uh, here's Roland Hall and Alan Udla and John Glue out in the field, and they've they've forced the um, uh, Livingston Piston Corps down into the muds. This was I don't know where we were at this point. I think uh, we had actually uh, pretty much taken this. We were probably taking about you know the sixth segment of core from uh, the bottom of this lake. So probably about six meters down and the sediment was getting pretty stiff. Anyway, once you force this down, then you've got to pull it back up. And so over here, uh, Roland Hall and John Glue are straining on this, trying to pull, uh, the, pull the core back out of the mud. And uh, <laughs> at this depth is taking considerable effort. Now, one thing I want you to note here is John Glue, you know, bright lad, but uh, uh, this is not the way to pull a, a, a core out of the mud. Uh, if you talk to any safety officer, say, you know, keep your back straight, lift with your legs, okay? So grab onto the, the core rods down low and pull straight up using uh, for lifting. Don't use your back, use your legs. Okay, so that's uh, um, the Livingston Piston Core, and it's sufficiently portable that you know you can toss it in the back of a pickup and and drive the lake. Wouldn't really want to backpack in, but you can toss everything into a helicopter, and uh, you know get it slinged into a lake. And so here we've been. This is up in the northern part of BC. We've flown in to a particular lake, a uh, sling load of of gear, including a couple of uh, inflatable rafts and the, the coring equipment. And here we've um, assembled uh, our platform that we're going to be using for coring. Uh, and so in this case, we don't have ice, which is, you know, ice is ideal if you've got thick ice, because you've got a really solid platform to work with. But you can also work from, um, uh, from some inflatable boats uh, create a raft with the inflatable boats uh, and work there. And the problem is you need to be really well anchored uh, in the lake. And so that means putting about, you know, four anchors in different directions or if possible, even tying off to trees on the sides of the lakes. Hopefully the lake's small enough that you can reach over to the, the margins of the lake with long enough ropes. Anyway, there's our two inflatables and our coring platform. And we're going to put this uh, uh, core down through the middle. Uh, here's, you know, similar arrangement. Uh, these aren't inflatables, but two small boats with a kind of a platform in the middle. And, um, you know, the core. And, you know, the first drive, you don't need it. You know, in fact, you don't want it. But as you go deeper and deeper, you need to put down a casing to guide the core down exactly the same hole each time you take a drive. And so this is setting up the casing, um, putting the casing down that's going to serve as a guide. So we go, continue to go down the same hole each time. Then um, once, as you bring up each segment up to the surface, you need to extrude that, um, that mud that you've recovered uh, out so that you can study it and wrap it up to take back into the lab. And so here is uh, Peter Rotheisler, uh, who is a graduate student some years ago. And um, we've got here uh, uh, a piece of plywood. And on top of that, we've got a, a layer of tin foil, aluminum foil. And then over top of that, there's a layer of saran wrap, you know, some plastic moisture and permeable wrap like uh, you would use for. Uh, sealing things that you toss into the fridge. And then we've got this mud that's been extruded out the core too. So we've got the mud, this has been forced out through the, the core tube onto this layer of, of saran wrap and tin foil. Um, Peter's just in the process of, of labeling the tin foil, so we have a record. We know which end was the top end, which one was the bottom end of the of the core, and so on. And then this will be wrapped up in the saran wrap um, and tin foil, and put into a core box to 
be brought back into the lab for further study. Okay, well, that's one kind of piston core, the Livingston piston core. Uh, there are other kinds of piston cores, and uh, what I'm going to mention to you is the Mackerith core. Now, uh, the Livingston is relatively portable. The Mackerith is not. It's a, a much uh, heavier duty device. Uh, and in this case, we're going to be lowering the Mackerith core down into the sediments on the end of a very sturdy cable. And rather than pushing the core tube into the mud manually, you know, with brute force, um, the Mackerith uh, core relies on compressed air. So you take out compressed air and you use that compressed air to force the tube into the mud past the piston. And then after the core tube has been pushed down into the muds as far as possible, then um, the remaining compressed air kind of collects in a barrel down there at the bottom of the sediments. Uh, and as that barrel fills up with uh, air, it of course becomes, it starts to want to float. And so this air filled chamber will pull the core tube up and out of the mud. Anyway, the fellow who developed this, um, um, John Mackrath, I thought, you know, this guy, he published a lot of paper, I, I think in the late 60s or maybe it was into the 70s, but he seemed like an absolute genius. You know, I read some of his papers and um, I was quite amazed, you know, his insights with respect to, to limnology. Uh, but uh, anyway, this is his, uh, his core, you can see these are the details. So um, compressed gas line hooking up here. And then we've got this tower that the core tube is enclosed in. This is the barrel at the bottom and the tube would be pushed down below this down into the sediments. Anyway, here's, here's a photograph of it actually operational out in the field. Uh, so this was a photograph I took back around 1990 in the English Lake District. And here are the people that were operating the core and you can see it coming out. And the thing to note is this thing is coming up like a missile off the lake bottom. And so it's potentially dangerous, okay? You're, you're basically setting up a, a missile down below. Uh, so as I said, you know, um, Macrath seemed to be a genius, but he just, just seemed to disappear at one point. And I was always kind of intrigued what happened. And so apparently the story is that he was out working on one of these lakes one day with his core and, you know, with a, a group of collaborators and the core got stuck down in the bottom of the lake. And, you know, they're kind of mystified now, how are we going to get that core back up? And so they, you know, went over, got kind of close to where uh, the core was and we're looking down and that sort of maybe pulled on the lines a, a little bit. Anyway, this thing came flying up from the bottom. This missile came up and knocked them out of the boat and into the water. I understand that they didn't drown, but Macrath uh, some time later, you know, um, died of pneumonia as a, a product of this little adventure. And so, although it's kind of an ingenious design, it's a dangerous design, so I don't recommend using it. Um, anyway, this is uh, uh, showing out on the, the water, you know, they've got the boat with the uh, core, this is the tower, that's the barrel there. Uh, the core tube is actually extending down here further. And to make sure that no none of the public came nearby, they had a police boat to keep anyone from straying into the vicinity of the core while it was in operation. And here's the, um, the core that they obtained. Uh, so you can see here, uh, these are the lowermost muds, kind of uh, radish brown clays um, that were deposited shortly after the last glaciation. And as you go upward, okay, so this is the first, the lowermost segment, then you come upward, it becomes clay or continues to be clay and silt. And then we get more organic. So almost black sediments deposited more recently. And that extends up to the surface. 
Okay, so that's a, another kind of piston core. Now I'm going to talk about a third kind of piston core. This is a Kuhlenberg core. And a Kuhlenberg core is a, a core that again is not very portable. It's extremely heavy. Uh, so you need to have really good access, a road up to the edge of the lake or <laughs> some massive helicopter, I suppose, might be able to move this thing. But it's, you know, this is, is really something to, to have to handle. Um, but the Kuhlenberg core, uh, you know, is set up like this. It's going to be lowered into the sediments at the end of a very, very sturdy cable. And at the end of this cable, we have the core tube. And the cable is attached to a piston down at the bottom, just as you'd have with the Livingston core. There's a headpiece. And up above the headpiece, there's a, a, a bunch of lead weights, massive amount of lead weight. Uh, set up above here, and immediately above that, a trigger, um, a trigger arm, and then the this is actually triggered by a little metal plate that sort of feels the bottom, feels when you've you've hit the the bottom of the the lake, and so the idea is when you lower this coring up setup down into the sediments, at some point this little weight, this little uh, disc of metal, its weight comes off, that allows the trigger arm to swing upwards and that releases the core tube and all of these lead weights to go crashing down into the sediments. So all of that, those lead weights push the core tube down past the piston into the mud. And this allows you not to get just a single meter of mud at a time, but you can get, you know, maybe 10 meters of, of mud in a single drive. And it all happens uh, basically instantaneously once that trigger arm uh, is triggered. <laughs> now, in order to do this, you know, you have to have really good access. And in order to pull this thing out, you need a massive winch as well. So here are some slides, uh, some images from us using this. And this again is when I was in Switzerland. So this is at Zeeberg Zee, and it was kind of a musical day because we had uh, this gentleman uh, playing his elk horn on the side of the lake. And then we had Swiss cows with their cowbells wandering around uh, the lake, you know? So uh, <laughs> it's unlike any experience I've ever had in North America on a field trip. Um, also here, uh, so we were able to basically drive to the edge of the lake. And so uh, this is one of two vans. And um, each of these vans had pulled a boat in. So we're going to work with two boats on the lake and erect a platform between the two boats. So there's one boat here, second boat over here. And this is a platform for coring constructed and a tripod. And the tripod is going to support the Kuhlenberg coring device. Here's Andy Lauter, who at the time was an assistant professor uh, in the uh, Department of Geobotany at the University of Bern. Um, and you can see here the trigger arm and the weight that would have been off the trigger arm is out of sight down below. But you can see down here this massive amount of lead weights and the very top end of the core down below. So this thing is going to be lowered on the winch until the weight comes off the trigger arm. The trigger arm is going to swing up and then all his lead weights are going to go crashing down, pushing the, uh, the core tube down past the piston into the mud. There is another view of it. Now, this too is a, a little bit dangerous. You know, uh, things can happen very fast. You, you don't want to be standing too close to this when it's triggered. You wouldn't want to have any clothing or anything caught up uh, in one of these cables. Uh, and, um, you know, when this thing flies up, it could smash your jaw uh, as well. So, you know, there's some uh, safety protocols that need to be regarded with respect to deploying one of these things out in the field. <laughs> 
Okay, so that's one device, not very portable. In terms of portability at the opposite extreme, we have something known as a reasoner percussion core. And this one doesn't have a piston, at least in its original design, but I think you could modify it so that, such that it would have a piston. Um, anyway, the reasoner percussion core is uh, you know, named because uh, we're going to be driving this by repeated hammering on the top of the core tube to force it into the, to the mud. Uh, so that's the percussion bit is because, in reference to this hammering. And Reasoner, it's named after Mel Reasoner, uh, who developed this as a graduate student years ago. I believe he was a, a graduate student at University of Calgary when he came up with this. And he wanted a core that he could take into some high alpine lakes in, in the Rockies, uh, cross-country ski in, so it needed to be light that he could, he could pull it in and, and work on the surface of the lake in the, the middle of winter. Um, so basically what this thing consists of is some climbing rope. So Mel Reasoner being a climber and lots of climbing uh, rope hanging around. So there's actually two pieces of climbing rope here. One that connects to the core tube, um, sits down below, low here. And the core tube was, I think it was just irrigation pipe or maybe, you know, I think something a little heavier than sewer pipe, probably irrigation pipe, um, but plastic, you know, basically ABS or, or, um, or PVC um, tube that he had drive in. Uh, and so there's the core tube and the climbing rope attached to it. And then the hammer simply consists of, uh, you know, again, um, picked up a, a few pieces of, um, you know, basically the same irrigation shop where he, he picked up, <laughs> His, his core to be put uh, some plastic pieces together and then fill this thing with sediment. So it's basically a plastic cement filled cylinder that can ride up and down on this freely on this, uh, this climbing piece of climbing rope. And then there's to manually lift and, and drop this, uh, this hammer, he has another piece of climbing rope. Anyway, it was very, very cheap. That was one of the main things. It was very portable. So you could just ski into one of these lakes in the middle of winter, um, uh, bringing this thing with him. Um, and it was cheap, you know, a poor grad student. I guess his supervisor didn't have, have a huge, huge research budget. And so this was what he came up with. Anyway, so lowered on cables or rods, well, typically with a, a cable, and then the core tube is driven into the sediments by a series of repeated strikes um, from this hammer, this concrete hammer up above. And gradually you drive this thing down into the, to the mud. Now there are some theoretical problems with this. Um, uh, it doesn't have a piston. It would be ideal to modify this such that it has a piston. Um, uh, the problem is that not having a piston, uh, there develops more and more resistance as you drive this deeper into the sediments, more and more friction between the sides of the core tube and the sediments, such that you get significant core shortening. In other words, the amount of sediment that you recover in here is not equivalent to the amount of sediment that was actually deposited. Um, and because of the resistance to penetration, um, you tend to get shorter cores than the actual depth of the mud penetrated. So in essence, you end up forcing the core tube past a certain amount of sediment as you push in. Now, I've also used this. Uh, so this is on a field trip into the area around Mount Waddington. Uh, so here we're flying past Mount Waddington with a helicopter, and there's a view of the helicopter bringing in a sling of gear uh, to the lake we were working on. And, um, you know, we took a raft out in the middle of the lake, and this is the core tube that we had forced down into the sediments using the, the, <laughs> the Reasoner percussion core. And we're not quite sure just how much mud is contained in here. And so I'm, I've got a 
a hand drill and I'm, I'm drilling some holes in the side to try to find out where the um, interface is between the, the mud and the water. And once we locate that, then I cut off um, the upper part of the core tube. It doesn't contain any sediment. And hopefully we manage to cut this off just, just at the mud water interface inside the core tube. And, and then we'd fly out with that, um, that core um, and examine that, that sediment in the lab. Now, another kind of coring device sometimes used is, is known as a freeze core or a, a frigid finger core. Now, this is a somewhat different sort of thing. So this is um, basically consists of a freeze box. So here we've got a box, could be a tube, but uh, in any case, this, in this case, it's a wedge-shaped stainless steel box uh, that's filled with dry ice and methanol, okay? So you fill this up with dry ice uh, and then uh, with methanol. And then there's a headpiece that fits onto it. And there's um, a core rod that attaches to that. And then there's a kind of a vent here. So a little tube that comes up uh, and you tie a rubber glove on top here. And so, the idea is that as this penetrates down into the mud, or after you drop this down into the mud, that dry ice, which of course has a, a you know, point of, um, uh, of melt, well, not really melting, sublimation, the sublimation point uh, is well below zero. And so this dry ice, um, you know, is initially a solid, but uh, is transformed into gaseous carbon dioxide rapidly. And so you have to allow the carbon dioxide an opportunity to escape. And that's what this, this vent tube is about. And the rubber glove is allowing the carbon dioxide to escape um, as the dry ice uh, disappears inside. Anyway, in the process, this being much below zero, you get a rind of sediment freezing onto the outside of the, uh, of the freeze box. And so you lower this whole operation down into the sediments, leave it there for some period of time, you know, maybe five, 10 minutes, then you pull it back up and you recover the sediment that's uh, frozen to the outside of the freeze box. So here's a shot of this in the, uh, the field, Brian Cumming, uh, the freeze box there. Uh, and it's already filled with methanol or filled with dry ice. Uh, he's going to pour some methanol in it and then attach the headpiece and lower it into the, the sediments. And there we have a core recovered. So the mud is on the outside of the core, not on the inside. You can see the mud down below and you can see the mud water interface and the water that was above the mud water interface represented in that core. So next steps here are to kind of clean the surface. Oh, you need to clean the surface. Um, it's going to be frozen so you can take a wood plane and scrape it off, clean uh, the surface uh, to reveal uh, an unsmeared, unsmeared under layer. Uh, and then um, as if you well, if you fill up the uh, the freeze box with warmer water after you know if you dump the uh, methanol and dry ice out and fill it up with warmer water, well then you can largely uh, pull this uh, core off of the freeze box, or you can use a chisel and a hammer to kind of uh, free it as well, or to assist with recovery of the core. Uh, once you get it off the core box, then you'd wrap it in saran wrap and a tin foil and keep it frozen as you bring it back to the lab. And of course, while you're working on it, subsampling it, you're going to need to keep it frozen as well. Okay, so that's how we recover sediments. Then the next question is, what's in there that we might be interested in? So what's in the mud? So there's going to be a lot of different stuff in there that gives us clues about um, what happened in the past. Okay, 
So the, the sediments are going to consist largely of clay, silts, and sands. In some cases, if we're dealing with a, a saline basin or a, a, a marl lake, there could be a lot of precipitates, you know, calcium carbonate precipitates or uh, maybe some other salts. And then there are going to be a lot of organismal remains, remains of plants, animals, fungi, etc., also preserved down in those muds. So, for example, one of the things that preserves really well in lake sediments are pollen. Okay, so here we've got mountain hemlock pollen grain. Uh, this is a pond lily, pair of pond lily pollen grains. This is a pine pollen grain. Um, and, you know, people that uh, there are people out there that are quite skilled in identifying different species of plants from just the, the pollen that are present there. Um, so I may talk about that more in a subsequent lecture. Then there are also algal remains, particularly diatoms. They have siliceous cell walls. And so those siliceous cell walls preserve really nicely in the muds and they are elaborately sculptured. So different species of diatoms are readily identifiable from these cell walls that are preserved down there in the sediments. You also get um, uh, remains of rhizopods. Uh, you know, these are basically uh, shelled amoeba and the amoeba itself, uh, you know, readily decomposes, but um, they're commonly covered in little plates and those may preserve in the muds. So here's a, a series of rhizopod, siliceous rhizopod plates, um, different kinds preserved in lake mud. Uh, sponges, uh, they have internal skeletons uh, composed of siliceous spicules. And so here are some example spicules. Okay. Uh, most of the spicules will be kind of needle shaped and structured. Um, but then you also get these birochulate uh, spicules. Again, they're composed of silica. So they um, readily preserve in the muds. Then we have some organic remains. Uh, so uh, cladocera, various bits and pieces of these preserved. So, you know, you when you did the zooplankton lab, you probably saw some uh, cladocera, intact cladocera in the sediments. Um, but um, in, or in the zooplankton samples. And um, anyway, there are various bits and pieces that tend to preserve, and particularly the shell or carapace, uh, the head shields, um, the post abdomen, uh, those things, sorts of things tend to preserve. Another, another kind of crustacean, uh, the ostracods or, or seed shrimp, they uh, leave little shells, tiny little shells uh, in the muds. Um, the shells look rather like, you know, little freshwater mollusk uh, shells, but they're, they're really, really tiny. And instead of a mollusk, we're talking about a little crustacean that produces these shells. Again, there are people that can identify, um, you know, remains of these various groups. Uh, mollusks, okay? Snails preserve really nicely. And also there are tiny fingernail clams that are often present in the muds. Um, they tend not to, because they're composed of carbonates, they tend not to preserve well in, in acid lakes, but they preserve well in uh, the more alkaline lakes. Uh, beetle root fragments. Uh, so these are beetle elytra, the in hardened front wings of beetles. There are people that readily identify those. And um, caddisflies, these are some bits and pieces from the heads of caddisflies. Uh, there was a lady at uh, Scarborough College associated with University of Toronto who was quite skilled at uh, identifying these bits and pieces. And then phantom midges. Uh, ha we have represented here uh, four kinds of phantom midges. Uh, Chiabras, uh, Chiabras flav no, this is Chiabras punctipennis, Chiabras pactipennis, Chiabras flavicans, Chiabras um, tributatus, and Chiabras uh, americanus. I'll talk about those maybe later on, but anyway, those are preserved there. 
And then we've got chronomid remains, chronomid head capsules. So these are uh, the head capsules of um, uh, midge larvae preserved in the muds. And we can identify those based on the dentition of their mentum uh, and uh, these ventromental plates and various other features. Okay, so that's what we can find in the mud. Now I'm going to talk about how lakes change through time. Uh, and today's emphasis is on how they, they might change naturally, a uh, subject that we refer to as lake ontogeny. So you may be familiar with the, you know, in biology, if you're a biologist, you may be familiar with this uh, concept of ontogeny. So ontogeny refers to the whole course of development during an individual's life history. So we can talk about the ontogeny of a sea urchin from the time of its you know, an egg's fertilization through to maturity and so on, or, or uh, in the case of humans, similarly, uh, from the time of conception uh, through to, to birth and uh, actually on through to uh, become an uh, elderly person and eventually die, you know, so, so ontogeny is about that sort of thing. But this concept of ontogeny, we can also uh, apply to lakes. How do lakes change from the period of their initial formation until they eventually disappear uh, over geological time. So we might ask, and limnologists have asked, is there a consistent natural developmental sequence that lakes tend to follow? You know, do they tend to follow certain predictable paths in their development? So for example, uh, you know, do lakes start off in an oligotrophic condition and proceed to a more eutrophic condition? You know, so maybe they start off nutrient poor with a little algal production in the lake. And over time, maybe they become progressively more nutrient rich uh, with a, an excess of algal production. Maybe they start off alkaline and, and tend to become more acid through time. And so people, you know, have asked these sorts of questions. How do lakes tend to to change over time. It may sound fairly uh, esoteric, but nevertheless, it's uh, something that, that academics uh, are very interested in, and it actually has some um, interesting applications as well. So what kinds of changes can we expect in lakes naturally through time? You'll note that this is kind of getting into what the end of term essay is about. You know, the uh, end of term essay is about thinking about how lakes are going to change from the current condition on into the future. Here we're looking at how they changed in the past. Okay, so people speculated on this initially. And so you remember Einar Naumann, one of the founders of the International Limnological Association. And uh, Einar Naumann speculated that the progressive leaching of soils would gradually deplete the supply of nutrients in a catchment, and thus lakes, he expected, would become more oligotrophic through time. And the technical term for this is myotrophication. Um, I don't know why you don't refer to it as oligotrophication. Anyway, this is uh, Nauman's idea was that lakes should become progressively less productive in nature over time because of the progressive leaching of nutrients out of catchment soils. Okay, so then people started making some observations by looking at lake sediments and, and trying to make some um, uh, inferences as to whether this sort of thing was true or not. Now Lundquist back in 1927 and Gams back in 1927 both made some observations of lake sediments. And Lundquist, uh, he noted that um, the bottommost sediments were composed largely of clay and silt, whereas later sediments uh, were more organic. And so he thought, well, the clay silt, that suggests, you know, there wasn't much um, biologically happening in the lake. So he suggested that this was probably an indication of initially oligotrophic conditions in the lake and the more organic uh, sediments that were uh, subsequently laid down uh, indicated probably higher productivity or more eutrophic condition. I mean, that was his initial suggestion. Um, Gams in the same year, um, he was looking at fossil midges, you know, 
chronomids preserved in the sediment. And he noted that the earliest midges um, were ones that um, he could regard as being indicators of high oxygen levels or oligotrophic environments, and that later sediments contained midges that he regarded as indicators of low oxygen conditions and thus a more eutrophic environment. So both of these guys, you know, uh, seem to find evidence that supported the idea of initially oligotrophic environment shifting towards a more eutrophic environment through time. Um, I mentioned to you uh, in the very first lecture, George Evelyn Hutchinson, who was a professor at, I believe it was at Yale University in Connecticut. And he had a grad student, Ann Wolock, and they published a paper back in 1940 on Lindsley Pond in Connecticut. And they just, well, looked at the organic content in the sediments. So they took a core from the bottom of a lake. They managed to get a core from the bottom of this lake. And the organic matter concentration was very low in the sediments that were initially deposited at the bottom of the lake. And then subsequent sediments that accumulated were more rich in organic matter. And then there was a decline up at the top. So Hutchinson and Wolak inferred that, okay, this probably an, indicates an initially oligotrophic environment. And then there was a rapid increase in uh, plant and animal life uh, that led to an increase in organic matter content until the lake reached some trophic equilibrium, you know, um, came up to some equilibrium level of productivity that it maintained through time. And so they note this initially sigmoid rise in the uh, concentration of organic matter in sediments. And then with um, European arrival, re European colonization of New England, you know, beginning back around 1600 or so, um, uh, that led to a lot of erosion. And so there was lots of silt and clays and mud, you know, getting deposited in lake. And so that accounts for this decrease in organic matter towards the surface. Okay. Now, Hutchinson and Wolak paid a lot of attention to this sigmoid curve phase in the early development of the lake. And you know, you see that sort of thing similarly in a lot of other lakes. Now, this is from a couple of lakes that I worked on in New Brunswick. And you know, uh, instead of plotting the organic matter content, I planted, I plotted the inorganic content, but it amounts to the same thing. So it's very little organic matter in the initial sediments, and then you've got a whole lot more organic matter uh, later on. So it's a very common pattern to see this. I just plotted the percent inorganic rather than the percent organic. Okay, so they paid a lot of attention to this sigmoid phase early on. And so here we have it. Um, this is time. Um, and number of individuals, what we would expect in terms of the growth of animal and plant populations. You know, uh, ecologists were talking about this at the time. So if you have an initial colonization phase, a lake that's initially being established, we might expect there to be following colonization an exponential uh, rise in the number of organisms living in that lake until you hit the carrying capacity for that lake and then things would plateau out. So that's what they thought they saw in the sediments. So they thought they could see the sigmoid curve. You know, this is time here. This represents time, you know, the depth in the sediments over here and this low organic content period, the initial colonization phase. There that sigmoid curve over here, the sigmoid curve. And there that plateau or carrying capacity, and there the trophic equilibrium. So um, they emphasized the similarities there. Um, now, another grad student of uh, Hutchinson's was Ed Devey, and he looked at this a little bit more uh, at Lindsay Pond, published paper in 1942. And again, here's this loss and ignition profile for the lake. And he not only looked at the organic matter content, but he looked at the concentration of cladocerin remains preserved in the muds. And, you know, they seem to follow kind of a similar pattern. 
you could argue, you know, initial colonization phase, sigmoid curve, and then uh, plateauing as it reaches carrying capacity. Um, and, you know, so there's uh, organic matter content or loss in ignition, the amount of Bosbina, they also looked at, they also looked at the abundance of chronomid remains, seemed to be a lag there, but similar. Uh, Plumatella, well, nothing much initially, big peak and then came down. But you can kind of see what, what they were looking at. Anyway, also in 1942, DV looked at the kinds of midges preserved in the muds, as uh, I believe Gams did. And he noted that in Lindsay Pond, again, the early midges, uh, he regarded as being indicators of higher oxygen concentration. He identified, you know, remains of tanny terraces or things he thought were tanny terraces in the muds and later midges uh, that he identified as chronomus. <clears throat> anyway, because he regarded tanny terrace indicators of high oxygen concentration and chronomus as indicators of low oxygen concentration, he again came to the idea that lakes probably start off in kind of an initially unproductive or oligotrophic condition and proceeded to a more eutrophic condition through time. Also in 1942, a paper was published, um, um, well, by, by Ray Lindemann, but this is actually published after his death. Uh, so he was, again, one of Hutchinson's students, and he had started to write this paper, but he was tragically killed, and uh, Hutchinson arranged that it was published after his death. And anyway, this is uh, the paper that resulted the trophic dynamic aspect of ecology. And, you know, you can get a copy of this and, um, uh, and read through it. Anyway, one of the things that uh, Lindemann uh, suggests in the paper is that oligotrophy to eutrophy is the initial stage of hydraulic succession. In other words, lakes started out as oligotrophic or unproductive and become more eutrophic through time. That was uh, his suggestion. And in suggesting this, he, he cites August Tienemann. Um, you know, uh, so August Tienemann had contrasting views to Einar Naumann on how lakes were likely to change through time. But uh, Tienemann was one of Naumann's collaborators in founding the International Society of Limnologists. Uh, so he cites August Tienemann. Um, uh, August Tienemann thought that nutrients should accumulate in lakes over time, leading to an increase in productivity. Okay, so kind of an opposite view to uh, what Nauman had suggested. Anyway, this, this idea that Lindemann and Devey and Hutchinson uh, were putting forward contrasted what now, with what Nauman had suggested would correspond to what Tienemann had suggested. Um, he also goes on and talks about how lakes change uh, later on in their development. So he starts off with a, you know, a lake that's initially occupying a relatively deep basin. It's uh, oligotrophic, unproductive, not many nutrients. And so the hypolimnion maintains a high oxygen level throughout the year. Then as the lake gradually accumulates sediments in it, um, the concentration of oxygen in the remaining hypolimnion becomes less and less. You end up with a condition where there's very little oxygen left in the hypolimnion. As this fills even more, the lake almost completely fills with sediment. And then you start getting peatlands forming around the margins of the lake, so a peat bog. And ultimately the idea was that this lake would completely fill in and a bog forest would develop over top of the, the peatland. Okay, so that's Lindemann's view of how lakes are likely to change through time. He also includes a, a plot that looks like this. So in terms of the productivity of the lake, he suggests lakes should start off in this oligotrophic environment, he imagined, proceed to a more eutrophic environment, but then does, it proceeds to something rather odd, suggests that then the lake senesce. I know this, this seems to be an anthropomorphic, 
anthropomorphism to me, you know, that as the lake gets old, you know, they become weaker and, you know, are basically talking about a, a geriatric lake, I suppose here. So the lake senesces. And so its productivity declines. And then um, the bog develops over top and the bog forest and eventually we get a climax forest developing over the former lake basin. Now that's my plot. This is what his original plot looked like, okay? This hypothe uh, hypothetical productivity growth curve uh, of a hydrosphere developing from a deep lake uh, to a climax forest in a fertile cold temperate region. Okay. Anyway, a lot of this is based on, on really pretty poor data, you know, just kind of sketchy data at this point that people had. Um, now, one of the people that was working with Hutchinson and, uh, and uh, Ray Lindemann and Ann Wolak, as I mentioned, was, was Ed Deavy. And in 1955, he published a paper, The Obliteration of the Hypolimnion, that goes into a little bit more detail with respect to these uh, expected changes. He suggests that as lakes shallow, we would expect a gradual decrease in hypolimnetic oxygen concentrations, and that that would eventually lead to an internal fertilization of the lake. Here are the ideas. Once the hypolimnetic oxygen concentration becomes too low, it allows phosphorus to escape from the sediments, you know, so when hypolimnetic oxygen becomes too low, iron becomes soluble, iron starts escaping from the sediments, that allows phosphorus to be released from the sediments. And once the phosphorus is released, that can fertilize the lake internally. And so we can expect an increase in productivity. So this is essentially what we mean by morphometric eutrophication. As the lake gets smaller and smaller, uh, uh, one would expect perhaps that the hypolimnetic oxygen concentration would decrease, iron becomes soluble, phosphorus is released from the sediments, leading to internal fertilization and increase in lake productivity. So here is this initial condition, oligotrophic, high oxygen concentrations, iron tending to be precipitated in the sediments and binding up the phosphorus. So the phosphorus being removed from the water, Later on, as lake infills, there's less oxygen left in the hypolimnion. Uh, if it becomes anoxic, then iron is released from the sediments. Phosphorus is no longer bound, it's released to the sediments. And when the lake mixes, that phosphorus is returned to the surface waters, stimulating algal production. Now, about the same time, roughly the same time in the mid 50s, uh, Ed Deavy also published another paper that I found quite interesting, Paleolimnology and Climate. Um, anyway, um, not going to go into a huge amount of detail here, but uh, uh, these are some of the things that Deavy has said, some quotes. Uh, the sequence oligotrophy to eutrophy may be considered the normal course of lake ontogeny. At best, lakes are poor indicators of climatic change. Okay, so let that sink in. The sequence oligotrophy to eutrophy may be considered the normal course of lake ontology. And of course, this is what, you know, similar to what uh, Lundquist and Gams and Hutchinson and Wolak and DV had been talking about. Um, but they also says at least uh, at best, lakes are poor indicators of climatic change. We hadn't really talked about it at this stage. But also in that same paper, he says, paleolimnology has been too little studied anywhere to warrant sweeping generalizations. So he's made some generalizations, but then he's kind of contradicts himself and says, well, we haven't really studied this enough. And he also states the concept that lake development is insensitive to climatic change may prove illusory. Hmm. So basically stay tuned folks. This brings me to 
Another paper, this was published back in 1957 in the American Journal of Science um, by Dan Livingston on the sigmoid growth phase in the history of Lindsley Pond. And so uh, Dan Livingston was, you know, working with this same group of uh, people um, and also did some work on Lindsley Pond. Uh, but he had some, some somewhat different ideas. Okay, and that was one paper. He also published a paper with uh, Boykin on the vertical distribution of phosphorus in the muds from Lindsley Pond. Okay, so there's Dan, you know, at the time he published these papers, I think he was basically a graduate student. So this is a, uh, this is a, um, a photo of him much more recently. So, Anyway, Dan Livingston published this paper where he re-examined the sediments of Lindsay Pond. And he, he tried to get an estimate of how rapidly the sediments in the bottom of Lindsay Pond had, had been laid down by looking for annual layers in the sediments. So, you know, sometimes when sediments get laid down, you can literally count back the years. The sediments are laid down often in annual increments that may be visible um, especially if you use a microscope to, to look at them. And so this is what he tried to do. Look at those sediments that were laid down in the early years of Lindsay Pond's development and literally count the years. So you could get um, a look at how rapidly the sediments had been accumulating. Now, uh, you may think this funny, you know, going into the counting layers of sediment. Why didn't they date the thing? Well, the problem was that radiocarbon dating hadn't been developed at this time. Radiocarbon dating hadn't been developed, and so they didn't have any effective mechanism for dating the sediments. Uh, there were other, there was no other radiometric dating methods either. Uh, so he was relying on these sediment layers, inferred annual sediment layers, to try to get a handle on how rapidly the muds had accumulated. Okay, now when he looked at those same sediments from Lindsley Pond, um, he noted that, you know, the rate of deposition initially seemed to be much more rapid. So he concluded, you know, really the reason why um, there wasn't much organic matter in these early sediments was because of rapid erosion. There was a lot of sand and silt and so on being eroded and deposited in the lake. Um, so this really is just an indication of the unstable landscape that existed immediately following glaciation before there were forests and stuff that had developed around the lake. So he attributes um, the change in organic matter content largely to changes in rates of erosion. He contends that the change in organic matter content was accompanied potentially by very little change in productivity. Uh, in the 1962 paper, Livingston Boykin, um, you know, kind of carried on with this, uh, and uh, he outlines that he thinks that the rapid erosion of, um, in that initial phase, buried a lot of the phosphorus, prevented the phosphorus from being regenerated, and that may have also limited production in those early years. This brings us to uh, a paper published in 1973 by George Evelyn Hutchinson entitled Eutrophication. It was published in the American Scientist. And, you know, the main thing here is uh, this paper provides a really valuable review of the early work in relation to lake ontogeny. So it's a really valuable review. And if you're interested in this subject, I would recommend reading it. But then along in 1983 was a, another paper published by Mel Whiteside, Melbourne Whiteside, the mythical concept of eutrophication. And Mel had quite contrasting views, uh, you know, as that title, a rather provocative title, I, I must say. Uh, anyway, he had quite contrasting views and he states in this paper, Many limnologists now accept the mistaken notion that all lakes naturally proceed from a pioneer state of oligotrophy 
to a more advanced state of eutrophy. Oh, hmm, trouble. Okay, so, you know, basically he's saying that Devi's ideas and those of his collaborators, uh, uh, you know, have unfortunately made their way in all of the textbooks about limnology, but unfortunately he considers their ideas to be wrong. Miller goes on and he um, uh, talks about eutrophication. He, see, people are continually referring to eutrophication. He, he thinks, you know, some clarity is needed here. The people need to remember that eutrophication is not synonymous with lake aging or lake ontogeny or lake succession. Eutrophication specifically refers to an increase in productivity over time. As lakes age or as they proceed through their ontogeny or as uh, we have succession lakes, it's not necessary that they become more productive. But the way things had evolved to this point, people had come to think so. So lake ontogeny, lake aging, lake succession do not imply that a particular kind of change has occurred. So, <laughs> You know, what are some of the problems with these early interpretations uh, that I've been talking about? Um, and there are a number of problems. One is the use of organic matter as an indicator of productivity. Okay, people have largely been relying on organic matter as an indicator of productivity. But in doing so, they ignored a number of things that are really quite important. Um, it's important to remember that those changes in organic matter content might not relate to productivity or solely to productivity. They could relate to changes in decomposition rates. Uh, as Livingston had pointed out, uh, there may have been differences in rates of erosion through time. Keep in mind that they had no radiocarbon dates or any other dating procedure uh, to calculate sedimentation rates. The first real attempt at this was by Livingston. Also, they were ignoring the origin of this organic matter. Was this organic matter actually derived from inside the lake? Was it actually autochthonously produced? Or was it actually derived from outside of the lake? Okay, or allochthonously produced? Now, you think about, you know, aquatic macrophytes and algae and, and these sorts of things. The things that live in a lake are generally really easily decomposable. You know, you leave a fish sitting around too very long or uh, a water lily or whatever, and they decompose really fast. They don't last any amount of time whatsoever. Whereas a lot of the other material produced in terrestrial environments, you know, wood and needles and stuff that gets washed into a lake, it's really resistant to decomposition. These things tend to preserve much more readily. And so there's a question about where that organic matter is derived from, and is it actually a reflection of terrestrial productivity or aquatic productivity? Okay, that's an important question. And I tend to think that a lot of it was probably allochthonously derived because a lot of these terrestrial materials, materials derived from uh, terrestrial plant matter, are really resistant to decomposition, much more resistant uh, to decomposition than the aquatic matter. So there we have it, some, some questions. There's our organic matter profile and questions. So was this low organic matter content due to low production or high rates of decomposition or high rates of erosion at the time? Uh, was this organic matter derived from inside the lake or is it derived from outside of the lake? Another problem, uh, some of these early studies um, relied on midges or chronomids as productivity indicators. And it turns out that tanitarsis is a really poor indicator of oligotrophic environments. You know, we know a lot more now, but tanitarsis is not a good indicator of oligotrophic environments. And, and you know, um, they occur all over the place in all sorts of environments not necessarily just oligotrophic environments. 
they also completely seem to overlook the, the, the changes in climate that were happening over this time period, okay? The effect of climate was largely ignored in these early studies. So if we think about what was happening, the initial phase of lake development, this was immediately following deglaciation. So the lake's initial formation was essentially in an Arctic environment and evolved, the climate evolved. So it, it uh, moved from sitting in an Arctic in a environment into a temperate environment. So climate warm. And where do we see this big change in organic matter? It, um, the big change in organic matter seems to um, occur just as the first trees are arriving around the watersheds. You know, and we can tell when the trees started to arrive because of things like needles and uh, pollen um, showing up in the lake sediments. Um, so again, is this organic matter really mainly derived from forest litter? I.e., is it, is it primarily derived from trees rather than from algae in the lake? If so, it has little relevance to lake productivity. Some other notes here. Most of the chronomids that uh, they regard as being indicators of cold or of oligotrophic environments are also cold stenotherms, okay? Most of the chronomids that occur in oligotrophic lakes also require cold temperatures. And so it wouldn't be surprising if they tended to disappear as the climate warmed because they were, are adapted to cold water conditions. So that's a problem. Um, another problem, all of these early studies were basically of the same type of lake. They're all studies of lakes that have developed in humid, temperate climates, okay? And all of these lakes had formed as a result of Glaciation. I see that I've got uh, lakes repeated in there. Anyway, typo. But anyway, there are all these lakes that they had studied to this point had all developed in a very similar climatic regime. Um, lakes that are currently sitting in humid, temperate climates, but they were initially formed as a result of glaciation. They hadn't considered lakes that had formed in other parts of the world, say, uh, somewhere where, like Australia, where you might have had basins formed as a result of deflation or, or lakes that developed as a result of uh, sinkholes and limestone terrain well south of the ice sheet, those, those things hadn't been considered. So what would we find if we looked at lakes that had a different climatic history? And so, you know, I'm just going to talk about here briefly, um, some lakes a little bit different. You know, this is a uh, lake in New Brunswick. And um, you don't just see a single rise in organic matter. You see an initial rise and then a uh, decrease in organic matter and then a rise again, okay? And these initial sediments with little organic matter have a lot of midges that we would tend to associate with oligotrophic environments. And then they decline and then they increase again, and then they disappear. Well, modern interpretation is that a lot of this is probably just due to climate change. So initially we have a cold environment coming out of glaciation. At this particular lake, conditions started to warm up, then it turned cold again, uh, and then it warmed up again. So this would be um, presumably about, um, uh, prior to about 13,000 years ago, then 12,000 to 11,000 years ago, it became warm. From 11 to 10,000 years ago, it became cold again. And then for the last 10,000 years, it's been warm. So if you have a different climatic history, you could see things that are quite different. And here is some, uh, you know, publication. Let's see, this, is, this would be one of Andre Levesque's publications. And so this is the amount of organic matter is represented by loss and ignition in the sediments. 
and he considers this these changes in organic matter content to be a reflection of climate, not of lake productivity. Um, and in fact, uh, we it's something that we often do now is we infer temperature from the midges, the coronalids that we find preserved in those lake settlements. And so this is a recon temperature reconstruction based on the species of coronamids found preserved in, in the muds. So similarly, it would be also interesting to look at lakes that have developed in the absence of climate change. And so um, there are lots of reservoirs that have been constructed around the world. And we can look at how those changed, um, largely in isolation from climate change. And if we look at uh, the development of reservoirs through time, it turns out that, that most reservoirs seem to start off with an initial pulse of productivity and then their productivity decreases through time. The initial high productivity seems to be due to nutrients that are released from um, the wood and forest litter that's decomposing and you know, nutrients are leached out of those up into the, the water. Whereas there's a gradual decrease in nutrients later on as that um, wood and forest litter gets buried in the bottom of the lake. So this contrasts with what uh, you know seems to start off in a more eutrophic and progress to a more oligotrophic kind of state. So we could also ask, what would we find if we looked at lakes that developed in tropical climates or in arid climates? Uh, what would happen if we looked at a lake that had um, suddenly formed abruptly in post the warm post-glacial period? So for example, if we looked at sinkhole lakes that had formed, you know, 3,000 years ago, rather than at the end of the last glaciation. Anyway, that's all that I have to say today, and I'm kind of hoping that I didn't run over time. Ooh, very close. Anyway, um, so I'm going to stop sharing. If anyone has some quick questions, um, you can hit me with them now. And sorry to run so close to the, the limits of lecture. Okay, um, that's enough for today, bye.